and as you know, that September 11th was this beautiful uh, day in New York. And I had um, gone to vote because it was election day prior to going in. And I was in my office when a Sergeant Brian Burke came in and saying a member of the media had um, called us to let us know that a plane had gone into the World Trade Center and that he was heading over. And the commanding officer of our public information division at the time, Tom Fahey, he was an assistant chief, called and told me that he wanted a lieutenant to go over. So um, I went over with another sergeant, uh, Jerry Falcon. And as we were going up to exit the ramp, there was a NYPD photographer walking up the ramp and we told um, her then. And instead of, if you're familiar with Manhattan, um, police headquarters is almost directly across from the World Center. But I figured a lot of emergency vehicles would be responding. So we went around the horn um, underneath the Battery Park Tunnel um, to get there. And I remember when we got on the FDR Drive by the Brooklyn Bridge, there was just paper floating all over the place. And I was thinking, wow, that's a, a lot of paper. Because in my mind, I was thinking it was a Cessna, like a small Cessna. It was a pilot from New Jersey who had had a heart attack while he was flying. And I half expected to see um, half a plane sticking out of somewhere in the building, not um, that it could be anything uh, bigger than that. But I was aware of the magnitude of the event in the terms of how and it was that was flying uh, and landing on the, the FDR drive. So I, we got to the World Trade Center um, at 8.54 that because um, back in the day, um, back almost 20 years ago, we had alpha pages. And I don't know if you would call them, they were like a step up from the beeper. You were allowed to send text messages, um, said that the, it went off uh, and it told me that the highest level of mobilization had been called for the NYPD and that everyone who respond to the corner of a church in Vesey Street. And so, we, we went, um, we parked the car on the west side of Liberty Street. And since we couldn't cut through the complex, we made it um, our way around on the outskirts of the building. Um, the North Tower had been the first one hit. Um, and, you know, the streets were already closed. I have to say that the NYPD and all emergency responders really fell into action right away in terms of the barrier trucks were already out putting barriers. Um, the traffic agents were already deployed to redirect traffic. Um, and, you know, someone really smart um, in the transit system, and I don't know who it was, but had the, the foresight to stop the trains coming in either direction from the World Trade Center, which you know is a transportation hub in New York. So it was, it was just after nine o'clock that the second plane uh, got hit. It, it hit. Um, and it wasn't like, oh, the plane hit and um, it, I, I can't describe to you what that was like. It was like a massive fireball, um, like the ground shook um, and, and the roar of the engine. You know, I grew up in Queens, not far from, Queen, uh, from Kennedy Airport. So, you know, I knew what the sound of a, a, jet, a jet engine sounded like. And it was just a roar. Um, as it approached and, and went into the building. Um, and honestly, um, the, the fireball, the shattering of glass, because don't forget, you know, the area had been sealed off because of the, the North Tower being hit. And now this was the South Tower. And that really did a great job securing the area. Um, and it was then um, that I remember seeing people jumping. Um, and that was just, uh, at first it was unbelievable because you're like, wow, look, look at all that's coming down. And then it took a while to realize that it was a person jumping. Um, and I personally, I can't imagine what that must have been like, um, because can you imagine being put in a position that that was the better choice? But I, on the other hand, I can't imagine what it was like to have the fire behind you that jumping was the better alternative. 
Um, you know, those buildings were 110 stories high, you know, so, and someone afterwards related to me that um, a son had called his mother and said, um, mom, um, I'm sorry, but I, I have to jump. Um, I can't, I actually um, can't imagine what that had been like. Um, and I remember thinking how helpless um, I was feeling um, along with other people because we knew looking from the ground what had occurred um, and we had helicopters in the air, but we knew they couldn't land with the smoke and the fire. So um, it, it was very tough because that's not a feeling that we're used to in the NYPD of being present at a scene and not taking control of. Um, but I remember, um, I remember thinking that um, that was the worst feeling um, at that time. And so when we got to the mobilization area, Joe Dunn, he was our first deputy commissioner at the time. And he grabbed me and um, said, Terry, get on that ESU truck and get a helmet. And um, I did, I went on. Um, he told me that there was a report of a third plane in the area. We didn't know at the time that there was, the third plane was actually the military giving us cover down there. So I go, uh, went on and it's the helmet that is green. It's made of Kevlar. It's extremely um, heavy uh, and it's worn by our um, emergency service personnel. And the reason why I'm telling you that is because um, uh, it became really important because without that helmet, I am really certain that I would have died um, uh, as a result of the building coming down. Um, so we're there to make sure that the media is able to do their job, but also to gather them up to say that we would do a, a briefing and you know, saw different people along the way. And then um, I went into the uh, North Tower, the South Tower, because there were some photographers that were in that area on the concourse level and they were taking shots. So I, I went up to the photographer that I, I saw and I said, listen, um, you, you need to leave because the elevators had stopped working and people were walking down. Mm -hmm. And you know, when there's a camera, people just stop and want to take photos. You know, they slow down when they realize that that's happening. So um, I think what was really amazing to me is that when people were there, there was no thinking. Um, as soon as you came out of the building um, and as you were coming out of the building, there was just so many officers that had responded that were just directing people. So there was no thinking. When you came down the concourse, you didn't have to think, do I go left or do I, it was just a sea of blue and just people saying, you know, keep moving, move to your right. And you just followed this line of blue out as firefighters and EMS were also responding and going up. Um, and as we're in the, um, in the South Tower, everything was uh, controlled. And I thought, oh, this is gonna be a long day. So I should go back to my car um, and grab my uh, sneakers and put them on. And you know, this is, I have walked the photographer out. I handed him to a uniform officer and just say, you need to get him out of the frozen zone. And then, you know, we're going to be having a press briefing. So just let him walk around the perimeter to get over um, to West Street. So as I'm going down uh, and walking underneath the overhang of the South Tower, walking towards my car, um, suddenly, honest with you, my first thought, it was an elevator train. But that didn't make sense. But I turned around and people were running it towards me saying, go, 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 it's coming down. And just for a second, I stopped and looked up. And it was sort of like, you know, you can't see the forest from the trees. It just was um, unbelievable. And that the force of the building coming down as it pancaked down actually blew me out of um, my shoes and uh, propelled me uh, across West Street. And uh, I landed uh, outside of, um, I think it was Amex, because the, the 
the, I landed on grass and it had just been, uh, the sprinklers had just gone off. So it was, it was wet and muddy, muddy. Um, and it was just amazing to just th see things swirling. Um, like trucks were like those little tinker tank trucks that were just being blown. And, um, you know, ambulances were there, police cars. And as I, I landed, I just got pelted, uh, pelted with stuff coming down. Um, and it just, I felt like I got, um, uh, uh, just surrounded by black smoke. Um, and it, it was pitch black. And I remember thinking, and I think this is the best analogy I can make, is that it was like if you've ever gone on a cave tour and you go down um, to X amount of levels. And when you get down there, they ask everyone to shut off their sh uh, flashlights and it is totally pitch black. That's what like that morning was when that South Tower came down. Um, but then I was thinking I must have been knocked unconscious. Um, but then I thought I wouldn't be thinking I was unconscious if I was, I wouldn't be thinking if I was unconscious. Um, and there were all sorts of um, cries. Uh, and I grew up with um, an expression uh, people used to use saying they were screaming bloody murder. And I think they came to realize what that meant and um, get it. Um, and there were all sorts of, but you know, I kept getting pelted and feeling of things on me. And then as I was laying there, I, I, I thought like we were being bombed, to be honest with you, because of, of the noise. And I don't know how much time um, had passed, but at one point I got hit um, in the head. Um, and I, I felt the helmet that I had on come off my head. Um, and I could feel the blood running down uh, my neck. Uh, and I had my right hand available and I, I reached back and something was um, embedded in my skull is the best way to um, describe it. Uh, so as I'm laying there and this is occurring, but still not being able to see anything, event, and people, you could hear people screaming and yelling. Um, as the smoke began to clear, um, I could hear someone you know, calling for help not too far. Uh, but it was very restrictive because I was underneath a lot of debris. And uh, I just felt around. Um, and I, I didn't initially find anything, but there was a firefighter who had um, his red light was going off. And he said, um, you know, are you, are you doing okay? And I said, yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm okay. And he said, I just stay down cover your mouth, you know, as best you can. Um, and, and when this gets cleared, we'll hopefully be able to get out of here. And so I was reaching and I grabbed someone's fingers and I repeated the same instructions that the fire had said to me. And as the smoke began to clear and I was able to get from my waist up out of the rubble, um, I had the hand that I said, listen, I'm going to try to get up. Um, my, my legs are pretty um, solid in, in, in this area, but um, I'm, going to, I'm not going to let go of your hand. And then the hand came up too easy. I realized that I had a hand and an arm um, and no one was attached to it. And uh, the firefighter came and and helped me and we dug um, and we just could not find who that arm um, um, belonged to. So that has always um, stayed with me. Um, so he helped me out. He, he asked two EMS people to tend to my head and they simply um, wrapped my head, they, you know, uh, as it was. Um, to stop the bleeding, but also they couldn't get the like chunk of cement that was back there out of my head. So with that, um, we heard people screaming. So we, we all joined forces because firefighters, and I didn't know that until this day, are told to roll uh, a truck or a vehicle in the case of a building collapse. 
and on line 9-11, which made total sense to do that, um, they did that, but there was no way to get out once they rolled under because all the debris just gathered around the truck. So we were able to um, pull several people out um, from underneath the fire truck. And we just stopped and would listen to voices and then we would start um, you know, digging out. And I think we pulled three people out. But then all of a sudden, another whole group of people were running towards us. And they were saying, the other tower's coming down, I'm out of here. And I was thinking, like, my body was in shock and where, where are we going? Um, so I was somewhat familiar with the area down by Battery Park City. And I thought, I'm going to run to war. I felt really unprotected at this time. You know, um, I didn't have a helmet on. Um, you've seen the video. There was like this rolling black cloud that just kind of comes. It was coming toward me. Um, and, you know, I'm barefoot. Um, and there was steel. Uh, fires are burning. So I just said, I'm, I'm going to run to the water. Um, because I felt like I could, if I got in, I could jump into the water, um, and if things came down, I could at least submerge myself and get some protection. Um, but as I was running, I got hit in the back, and I went straight from running down straight onto my knees, and um, I didn't know what had happened, but I knew I had gotten hit in the back, and I knew I wasn't going to make it to the water. So I, you know, I turn around, that cloud is getting closer to me, and um, I spur and I pulled on the door and I was able to go into it. And at first I'm thinking, oh, this building must be under construction because um, those lights and um, that you see at construction sites, those were the only things lit. But of course, you know, the lobby uh, windows and everything was glass. So I figured, let me walk further into the building. But as I got to the elevator bank, which were all, all the elevators were stopped at one, smoke was starting to come through um, the elevator shaft. So I, I said, let me go into a, a stairwell. And when I opened up the door, there was just a line of people up in the stairwell. It was an apartment building. I mean, people were in all sorts of states of dress. Like people, it looked like people had just come out of the shower. There was a woman holding a very small baby. Um, and I, it, it seemed very surreal. Um, but I was starting to think that everything in Lower Manhattan was going to come down. I mean, if these two massive towers could come down and they were hitting other buildings. So, um, I, you know, I just told them who I was. Um, and I said, listen, we, we need to evacuate this building. Um, and I went out and I thought, um, let me go to the, and the same thing occurred. That black smoke started to become this grayish ash. Um, and I, I went to the door and I saw um, two people asking me, you know, I could see the back of their shirts and it said TARU on it, T-A-R-U, which is our assistance and response unit. So I, I just opened the door and I was like, TARU, I just screamed um, and they turned around and one of them, uh, he was um, someone I knew, Pete Moog. And I explained to him that, you know, all these people are in the, in the lobby and that um, we needed to get them out. And he said, you know, via the police radio, um, he had heard that we were moving people out to um, Staten Island and New Jersey via boat. And so I was like, all right, so, you know, we got, you know they were like, we'll, we'll go with you. And I turned around and Pete said, yeah, hey, Terry, um, listen, I, yeah, I think you better go down. And I said, you know, you need medical attention. And I said, yeah, I, I you know, they, I saw EMS, they wrapped my head. And he said, no, he says, you have a shoulder stick. And I think Pete had some EMS training because he was just like, just leave it in because, you know, that's the smarter thing to do. Um, so I was just like, you know, okay. So, um, Obviously, I knew something was there, but I didn't know that it was glass. And we evacuated the building and we started trans uh, putting people as boats came into the harbor um, on the boats. And 
there was one pulling out and I could see the NYPD harbor boat pulling in and I waited um, for the police boat. And then by this time, the sun starts to come out. It, it, it was just so bizarre. It turned back into this really nice day, except it felt like you were in the midst of a war zone. So when the harbor unit uh, pulled in, um, the captain over there said, listen, we got an injured uh, member of the service here. And EMS came over and said, all right, if, if you're getting on the boat, we have to pull this glass out of your back because um, if the boat rocks, it could go in and cause more damage. So they, they cut off my, my shirt um, and wrapped me, pulled out the glass and, and wrapped me really tightly and uh, put me on the boat. And um, I didn't want to leave Manhattan. I was thinking, can I, like, can I go to like a hospital downtown? And they were like, listen, we're getting everyone um, over um, to the Jersey side. And I went over to um, Ellis Island. And when we got there, I, it's the, the strange things to remember. They just put white tape on your wrist. And, and I kept mine uh, for a long time. It just said my name, that I was a lieutenant in the NYPD, my social security number. And when we get over to Ellis Island, they lifted me out of the boat and put me on a wheelchair, in a wheelchair to sit because I couldn't lean back because of my head and because of my back. And I was sitting there and they came to, to bring me. But and as I'm sitting there under a tree, I see a person who was laying on a structure, but I, his knee, all of a sudden, his leg just made this very bizarre uh, turn. And so I said, listen, I, I can't lay down. You know, it, it's gonna be a waste of an ambulance because I, I can't use the stretcher. I said, but there's this guy that's really badly hurt. Um, and it's, you know, his leg is, is very mangled. So they put us both in the same ambulance. They loaded him on the stretch. They lifted me onto the, on the bench. And um, it was kind of interesting because he, he pulled himself up and he said, hey, I know you. He said, um, you know, you're in DCPI. And I said, yes. He says, I'm David Hanshu. I'm a photographer for the Daily News. We've worked a couple of scenes together. And I was like, oh, right. You know, when I looked at him I, and I'm looking at his leg, um, and I said, are you okay? And he said, um, you know, he was obviously in shock, but he, he was very concerned about his family um, because he lived in New Jersey. Um, his wife knew that he was at the World Trade Center and he had no way of getting in touch with them. So I said, um, listen, a park ranger had come up to me um, while we were on Ellis Island and he was able to, um, get in touch uh, with my family to let, I just left the message, just let them know that I'm, I'm alive. And he came back with the message and said, just call, you know, their only request is when you get a chance, please call. Uh, but I told them that, that you were okay, um, that I was at least, uh, you know, alive. So um, I said to David, when we get to New Jersey, I said, I'm assuming they're taking you right into surgery. And he wrote his phone number on this white band uh, on my wrist. And when we got to the hospital, um, I was able to um, give it to the nurses to call so that his family would be at least able to know that he was alive and the hospital he was be at because he was um, lived on the Jersey side. So, um, you know, when I arrived at the hospital, um, you know, the hospital was fantastic. The, uh, emergency room staff, they immediately did an uh, x-ray, put me on oxygen, checked out all my wounds. And um, I remember uh, the surgeon coming over to me uh, and I didn't know that it was a surgeon, but she said, I have some good news and I have some bad news for you. And I said, well, what's the good news? Because it's been a long day already. And she said, well, the good news is, is that you need to go right into surgery. Um, and we have an operating room. Uh, available and I'm the surgeon, so we're going to head right there. And I said, "Oh, great!" And I said, "Well, what's the bad news?" And she said, "You've had blunt force trauma to your head, and we can't give you any anesthesia." And I was thinking, "That is not good news." Um, but um, she was wonderful. Um, 
uh, they uh, did my head first and then they did my back and um, I recovery into the recovery room and through the small box, you know, it was a, a, a double door, but you know, they have those small square windows um, at the top. And I was just looking through it because I couldn't lay prone. So I had to be in an upright position. And I looked up and I had brother Kevin coming towards the door. And um, I could tell that he was as happy to see me as I was him. And they, they stopped him and they made him put on all the necessary precautions. Um, and he came through. I, it was um, just wonderful to see him. I, I, once I saw him, I, I kind of felt like everything would be okay. Um, he was a, a detective in the NYPD at the time. And um, uh, he had was able to track down um, where I was and came over to get me. And so he spoke to the surgeon and you know, they said, uh, given the severity of um, my head wound, um, he said I couldn't be, the surgeon told him that I couldn't be left alone for 72 hours. And he said, um, you know, that was fine. But there was this sense, even at that point, which was hours later, that everyone was going to rise up out of this rubble and hospitals were going to be over. So I asked, um, you know, could my brother at least bring me back to New York? Uh, he's he promised the surgeon he would um, take custody of me and make sure that um, everything was okay. His plan was get me back to Manhattan, um, and uh, which we did. And um, his wife is a registered nurse. He was going to bring me out there. And then, um, as it turned out, um, when we got back, um, he brought me back to police headquarters where I was. We we went to, actually. So many people had gone with other officers to the emergency room at the hospital. They jumped, they asked them, can I get a ride back? Because people knew that this was an ongoing scene and needed to get back to Manhattan. So he filled it up as much as possible. Um, I'm sorry, I just need to um, close all those. Um, so several people jumped in the car and we drove straight back to the World Trade Center site. Um, it turns, um, you know, it turns out that, you know, they had wrapped my head. They had given me, you know, those green surgeon's pants and a, a blue top. Um, my ankle, uh, was broken, but they couldn't cast it because I had all these open wounds, um, on it, but, um, they were able, they agreed to release me, um, to Kevin and gave prescriptions and also said like I needed to go um, get a, a, an MRI of my head and CAT scan. And, um, but we drove first back to the World Trade Center and it was so, so devastating to see, you know, um, that, like things were just on fire and just the mass uh, destruction um, that occurred. It, it was so, so massive. Uh, that's the only way I could describe it. Um, so Kevin did bring me back um, because everything I had was in my office and um, and I, he needed to take care of something. And I said, listen, I, I just need to gather myself. Um, and well, he was, you know, as the day progressed, um, I, along with two other people, um, went out to North Shore Hospital. Um, and uh, that's where I had um, my CAT scan and my MRI. Um, and then um, my brother, uh, instead of him, I have a sister um, who lived uh, close to the hospital, who was a stay at home mom, lived right there. And I wound up uh, going to uh, Beth Page. Uh, but it is certainly um, one of those days that uh, will always stay with me. Um, you know, we're coming up on the 20th anniversary and I wanna say that's, that's true. Um, and you know, every September 11th, I called Joe Dunn, who was the 
person who told me on the helmet because um, I, you know, he he was the first deputy commissioner, and I know that he took um, our loss of 23 officers to heart. And I always want him to be reminded on that day that it was because of his leadership that I'm alive and well today. Um, you know, it's it's hard to think back. You know, people who let a made a left instead of a right died, the people who made a right or a left lived. Um, so, I, you know, when I look back at that day, um, it's, it's tough to recall all the things that, you know, I saw and I, you know, the smell of, of death um, and, and, and the sound of, of people crying for help. Um, all those senses um, stay with me, but I have to say what also stays with me was the remarkable professionalism of all the first responders. Um, you know, we're trained to do exactly what we did that day. And as horrific as the loss of life was um, that day at the World Trade Center, uh, they estimate that for every person who died, uh, we were able to get 10 people out of those buildings. Um, and I think when we recall that it was the worst terrorist attack ever to occur on Mar American soil, I think that we also need to remember that it was also the greatest rescue ever, effort ever. Chief, Tob Chief Tobin, you had two serious injuries. You had a piece of glass sticking out of your back. You had the, the neck injury. You never mentioned the word pain in any of your description of what happened. What, did you feel pain? What was your body feeling? You know, I, having never been in a situation like that, I, I mean, don't get me wrong, it did hurt. And, um, but I think adrenaline um, just took over um, and served for me a wonderful function. I mean, there was pain, but probably nothing to the extent that I would have ever um, experienced before. But that mechanism of um, being in that situation uh, and the amount of adrenaline really helped. And, you know, like, you know, having the experience of holding someone's limb, you know, and thinking that person was alive, I was conscious I had all my limbs. I, I, like, it puts a real clear perspective on things very quickly. You saved the lives, helped save the lives of at least three firefighters that day and all those people in the apartment building. And uh, you were awarded the NYPD Medal of Valor for being a hero on that day. How has your perspective on life and your career changed since that day? Um, I truly believe that I was meant to be doing exactly what I was doing on that day. Um, because a lot of people did reach out and say, wow, you know, I guess you're in for a career change um, or um, that I would put in for a, a you know, a disability pension. Um, but I, I really do feel that working for the NYPD is a vocation. Um, and I, even in hindsight, um, you know, other than not wanting it to have happened at all, um, I do believe that um, I was doing exactly what I was meant to be doing that day. And not only do you still work for the NYPD to this day, you had a recent promotion. Uh, you are now NYPD Chief of Interagency Operations. That is an amazingly big promotion, one of just a few women who hold the role of chief in the NYPD. Major congratulations. But I also need to ask you about your health. And I want to ask you about one other thing. You were caught up in two dust clouds. How is your health? Because anyone who is down there, their health is at risk, much less being caught up in two dust clouds. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there, without a doubt, there have been repercussions from 9-11. Um, I maintain um, my participation in the um, World Trade Center 
uh, follow-ups. Um, I'm very diligent. Um, but things like um, the smack to the back of my head, that blunt force trauma with that piece of cement, um, I guess it was about five or six years after 9-11, I kept getting headaches. Um, and I didn't know what was causing them. So finally, you know, the department uh, sent me for an MRI because it was so sporadic. I didn't think that um, I couldn't isolate like, uh, oh, if I had something cold, it would happen. It would happen very arbitrarily, very infrequent, but very intense. Um, and it was only on my left side of, of my, my face. I would feel a lot of pressure. So um, I had the MRI done and it revealed that um, I had my teeth, uh, my wisdom tooth um, on this side, not that of my head when I got hit with the cement. And it took, I guess, five years for my teeth to shift and it knocked this wisdom to sinus cavity. And it was just floating there. And every now and then it would hit a so I went, and fortunately, I had been very diligent about going to the dentist um, prior to 9-11. And so I had all the x-rays um, from my own dentist. And I went to an oral surgeon through the police department, uh, Eugene Lasota, who was just amazing. Um, and he did a set of x-rays uh, at that time. And uh, he said, two thirds of your teeth are going to come out. Uh, they had been cracked. And so um, it took three years, but they replaced two thirds of my teeth um, as a result. But no cancer, no respiratory illnesses? I, I mean, I go, I go um, faithfully to Mount Sinai um, and get a um, no cancer so far. That's wonderful. How about PTSD, nightmares, anything else? I don't uh, have uh, nightmares about 9-11, but I think it's something that I'm always conscious of. Uh, um, and the amount of, of grief, I make it a point to go down um, to the World Trade Center on September 11th. And I, I go to Latter because my cousin, uh, who was 33 years old, was a New York City firefighter. And he, he perished um, on 9-11 in the towers. Um, and so it's, it's really important always to acknowledge um, all the people who lost their lives. Um, and even today, and I'm sure on the 20th anniversary, um, it's going to be a day of um, where you just feel that collective consciousness of grief and how, how much people have suffered as a result. Is there anything else you want to add? No, I, I thank you for doing this. I, I think um, it's important that we remember. And, you know, uh, I teach on the college level and it's amazing because some of my students now weren't even born. So it's really part of history um, where it's so much um, a part of so many people's lives in the NYPD who responded that day. Thank you, Chief Tobin. Mm -hmm.